So welcome back to the second day of the CII annual conference. And as we started our conference yesterday, we heard about new technology shaping the future from Barry LePatner. As we start day two, we'll continue to focus on how new technologies will affect the future of the construction industry. Please welcome to the stage Jan Tuckman, Editor-in-Chief of Engineering News Record and the 2014 Carol H. Dunn Award recipient. They said this was very simple. <laughs> Forward, back. Okay. Good morning. Thanks so much, Dan, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be back at CII and particularly honored to give a keynote as last year's Carol H. Dunn Award winner. That honor celebrates cost effectiveness. And I'm here to talk about how new technology makes its way into, constru into the construction industry when it demonstrates that attribute. Now, you might be thinking, didn't we hear about new technology yesterday? Yes, you did. <laughs> but this is the ENR perspective. ENR has always probed the future. For the magazine's 100th anniversary in 1974, yes, we were 100 in 1974, we published a book by that name, Probing the Future. Two years ago, we tried the technique Intel uses to explore the future of work. We invited readers to submit science-based science fiction stories about the future of construction, and we published them in print and online. Last year, oh, we didn't advance yet, did we? Okay, sorry, this is, you're supposed to be looking at this. There we go. That shows you the, the science fiction issue on the left there. And last year, we looked at projects that have been proposed on the edge of engineering and asked experts to rate how dreamy or possible they might be. I've been marveling at some of the things ENR is covering, being put to work on job sites today that would have seemed like science fiction to me not that long ago. If we spin that forward, I wonder, what technologies might be just within reach? What might the industry be using just a few years from now? And then what about five years or 10 years? Okay. This thing with me here. I like to put my acknowledgments up front. I didn't come up with all this information by myself, so I wanted to um, tell, let you know about the people I talked to in the con construction professionals, suppliers, professors, and especially my staff at ENR, who helped me assemble the, the stories that I'll tell you about, the photos and the video clips. I quickly, oh, again, here we go. I quickly discovered that my concept about exploring the pace of change in construction technology was already the subject of a Theatech committee. There's a committee for everything. Fortunately, one of my sources was Fernanda Leite from the University of Texas, who told me about the Horizon 360 team, where six researchers and six industry profes professionals meet regularly to seek and identify new technology-based solutions and innovative practices and evaluate how close they might be to being implementable and cost-effective for construction, and whether they could lead to inc incremental or breakthrough industry advancement. The team assigns new technologies to four the four quadrants you see on the graph. Watch, learn, pilot, and use, where the x-axis is not relevant to relevant, and the y-axis is emerging to mature. The team says technologies now in the watch phase, like autonomous vehicles, may move along the curve, although we can't say for sure, say that for sure for all technologies, Leite points out. What are some of the technologies making a surprising impact today? Surprising to me, at least. There are lots of examples of 3D printing making an impact. 
but one of my favorites is from ENR's cover story by Nadine Post last year on the new Atlanta Falcon Stadium design. 360 Architecture, which now is part of HOK, won the commission for the design with a daring pinwheel-shaped kinetic roof where cantilevered pedals ride, ride on tracks supported by 70-foot deep trusses. The architect was the dark horse for the $1.2 billion project, and senior principal Bill Johnson decided to challenge the status quo. Atlanta Falcons owner Arthur Blank wanted an architectural icon, and Johnson had a fresh idea. The 360 team, including structural engineer Bureau Hapold, kinetic architecture consultant Hoberman Associates, and MEP engineer WSP, brought in a scale model with a motorized roof. To get, get that motorized roof and model done in time, they used five different 3D printers in different cities around the country, and all going at once and shipping the parts back to, um, to the home office. And then they assembled the model, took it to the interview, and at the interview, Johnson invited the committee to gather around the model. You can imagine the tension in the room. The Falcons owner pressed the start button. The 360 team held its breath, and the model roof opened successfully. <laughs> 3D printing helped them get the job. ENR editors Tom Sawyer, Jeff Rubenstone, and Luke Abathi have written a dozen or more stories in the past two years about applications of drones to construction work. Immediate applications have emerged as the unmanned aerial systems proliferated, became easier to control, had longer flight times, as much as 90 minutes, and integrated with cameras and other systems. There are obvious advantages for inspecting hard to access civil works like dams and bridges and for quick prog progress reports on far-flung construction sites. An ENR story in April noted that the number of providers that legally can offer drones as a tool is growing. Uh, one of them is asymmetric technologies shown in this photo doing a dam inspection. And at the Anaheim Regional Transportation Intermodal Center, and I think this is going on a lot of places, uh, the project manager used a small drone just to take progress photos. Let's take a look at this short video clip. It's probably take us about $1,500 a month for aerial photographs. I believe you can't go um, you can't use the commercial use you've got to respect all the privacy and I think it's you can't go over national parks you can't go in the flight line of uh, uh, airspace. airspace so this is considered like hobby use right yeah but then you just you can yeah, look we're not at selling the photos. it for anything you know this is <laughs> yeah. more just for documenting uh, for documenting a job site there's different modes I will set it to take a picture every five seconds now that it's green, I know I can fly it up, and now when I go up, I will look and I'll try to keep the red facing the job site. This, I think, with the camera is probably about $1,200. So you made that up in like one month? One month. That's, that's what we love about that, about that little video, is how he, he just grabs the, the drone out of the air. <laughs> so it's just a little fun. Um, also, surveying and mapping equipment firms are making investments, with many companies already offering their own drones that are tailored to the needs of construction surveying. UAVs may not replace surveying equipment, but they will certainly narrow the scope of what you'll need a total station or other ground-based equipment for, says a director in Trimbo's, Trimble's geospatial division. It is, a cha is changing the workflow. In the past, you might hire a survey company to do a topographic survey of the land. Now you can take out a UAV with some of the other survey technology and do the initial planning and survey in a couple of hours versus days or weeks using traditional technology. And what you end up with is a much denser info, info set, he says. Just this week, ENR has a story on construction of a $25 million, 217-acre unmanned aerial systems park in Grand Fork, North Dakota. 
on an out-of-use Air Force base. Even before the first phase broke ground, the developers started pushing drone-related research by partnering with the developers of an air traffic control system for drones. The park selected Virtual Air Boss by Smart C2 for the flight management system to manage takeoffs and landings, coordinate with the local Air Force base, manage emer emergency scenarios and schedules. Smart C2 is involved in a multi-phase NASA project to develop an unmanned aircraft traffic control operation. Probably needed. The story goes on to describe the current Wild West conditions of drone usage in the US, with hobbyist drones popping up unpredictably. Recent near misses with passenger planes have been reported in North Carolina Poland and London's Heathrow Airport, as well as incidents in which private drones interfered with aerial missions fighting wildfires in California. So the need for caution is a serious one. Oops, that, there we go. One of the big gaps in the world's migration towards renewables is energy storage. But there are advances in batteries to power those drones, for example, to power electric vehicles, and even at the very large scale to provide peaking power for utilities. ENR wrote about a fuel cell farm made from refrigerator-sized cabinets filled with Bloom Energy servers, natural gas-powered fuel cells manufactured and owned by Bloom Energy. Each server, each energy server contains a stack of solid oxide fuel cells made with Bloom's patented process and design already delivering power to the local grid in a deal with utility Delmarva Power and Light, the estimated $40 million Red Lion Energy cent Center will produce 27.5 megawatts, believed to be the largest fuel cell installation in the world. In June, ENR's Jeff Rubinstone attended the rollout of Volvo Density Direct, an intelligent compaction system that calculates pavement density in real time with an onboard computer that can improve its own performance. It is expected to be on the market by the end of the year. Compacting asphalt pavement sufficiently is crucial to extending the life of roadways. Intelligent compaction technologies offer methods of evaluating the state of pavement compaction in progress to help operators avoid under or over compacting. Most intelligent compaction methods rely on measuring the relative stiffness of the pavement and display a real-time GPS-enabled map of how many passes have been made over the pavement mat. But contractors actually need density numbers, not stiffness. A Volvo, a Volvo research engineer says the new system consists of a GPS antenna, temperature sensors on the front and back of the machine, a touch display, and an accelerometer on the drum. The accelerometer measures the vibration of the drum, but while other companies use this to estimate stiffness of the pavement, Volvo takes the same signal and estimates density. Density Direct works by training an onboard computer to recognize the characteristics of a predefined, properly compacted area of the pavement mat. Then it compares measurements on the rest of the paving job to this calibrated, correct pavement. The development came from the work of Sesh, Sesh Komuri at the University of Oklahoma, who developed a computer that can improve its own performance. Its artificial neural network can journalize and learn as the machine is doing the compaction. The system is able to respond to changing conditions, adapting its model of proper compaction as it gains new data. The Internet of Things envisions computers everywhere, and infrastructure assets are no exception. This is already in action on bridges that have embedded sensors that report structural health. The San Francisco Bay Bridge, for example, has two kinds of accelerometers, and a humidistat and temperature relative humidity data logger. The accelerometers measure the response of the bridge during seismic or wind events. The humidi humidistat and TRH control measure the relative humidity 
in the dehumidified zones, areas that are kept below the specified relative humidity to avoid corrosion. The systems are already delivering data. And now for the when. On the when side, there are so many possibilities and really exciting work underway at universities and startups around the country and around the world, of course. I've made a wild guess about when some of the technologies um, might come into more common use. And you'll see some things that are on, they were in, they're in the now, but in a more advanced form, they're in the when. <laughs> and it could be a year, it could be five years. I mean, obviously we don't know about these things. It could be this, the end of this year or next year. Some of them might come along very fast. Um, but first, just for fun, Let's think for a moment about the far future scenarios we see in the movies to stretch our imagination. I saw the firm Her in a few wild months of trying to see all the films nominated for Best Picture in 2013. I don't think I'm gonna do that again, it's too hard. So many movies. Um, uh, I couldn't remember some of the details, so thank you Wikipedia for filling in the holes. Her got five nominations, including Best Picture, and one for Best Screenplay. The romantic comedy drama, written, directed, and produced by Spike Jones, tells the story of Theodore Twombly, played by Joaquin Phoenix, you see in the picture here, a man who develops a relationship with an intelligent computer operating system, personified through the voice of Scarlett Johansson. You can't hear that, but it's, that's her on the, in, the, in the computer. Theodore purchases an oper a talking operating system with artificial intelligence designed to adapt and evolve. He decides that he wants the OS to have a female voice and she names herself Samantha. They fall in love. Theodore panics when Samantha briefly goes offline. When she finally responds to him, she explained that she joined other OSs for an upgrade that takes them beyond requiring matter for processing a form of AI transcendence closely related to the theorized technological singularity. Theodore asks her if she is simultaneously talking to anyone else during their conversation and is dismayed when she confirms that she is talking with thousands of people. But she com comforts him. I've only fallen in love with a few hundred. <laughs> now that's the part I remember from the movie. <laughs> the point of this story to shift gears and think that if the giant tux, touch screens of Spielberg's 2002 mystery thr thriller Minority Report, remember him going like this on the screen, um, it seemed quite fanciful at the time. We, but we have such giant screens working for us today. I saw them at the University of Texas. There was Fernanda going like this on the screen, although her screen doesn't show the future. What part of the story of her might come true 13 years from now? Wearables are already somewhat in the here and now. How many of you have an iWatch? Anybody have an iWatch? Hold up your, hold up your eye. No iWatches out there? How about an iRing? Any iRings out there? IEEE Spectrum, the magazine of the electrical engineers, Association, which is my second favorite magazine after ENR, um, really is good. <clears throat> uh, it, showed, <clears throat> it showed a computer in the form of a glove on its cover last year. A sophisticated and construction specific wearable is the heads up display Golden Eye, which you see in the picture. Uh, it was shown publicly at a conference a few years ago. It has a voice operated headset for dis data, displaying data on a chip and for interfacing with a computer either by direct Bluetooth connection or over the internet to remove to, to remote locations. Its sharp graphics, ease of use, and overall wow factor had attendees lining up to try it. The developer Copin Corp was acquired by Motorola, and, but we're still waiting for you know, public availability. Uh, watch this short vi video from ENR.com to see the potential. Roll the video. Uh, I'm wearing the GoldenEye headset here. It has a band over the head to hold it in place. We have the screen here, the, the micro display that you, is only a quarter of an inch diagonal, but actually projects a 15 inch screen in front of me. And I talk to it. 
notice that I wear this device below my line of sight, below the eye. This allow, enables me to have conversation with other people and talk to them without a problem. It also allows me to get on with the work that I'm doing whilst still being able to glance down into the display to get the information I need. We are, we've been coining the phrase information snacking because this is what GoldenEye is about. It's about getting the information you need and then getting back to your work. You're not meant to sit here and watch videos for five hours at a go. So now it's in this position. I have a microphone just above the mouth that I can talk into and control the device. And I can issue commands as we go. Um, Bentley Explorer. This brings up now the ability to look at 3D models. Open document. The system will now talk to my PC remotely over Bluetooth, where I have to authorize it. It brings up the 3D picture, and now we can get to look at the 3D picture on GoldenEye, even though this is actually taking place on a remote computer somewhere. That computer could be in your bag, on your desk, or Or a thousand miles away. Okay. Anywhere we have a link to via Bluetooth and then uh, Ethernet or Internet. Okay. Rotate. And so we can do more than just look at this picture, we can interact with it. Here we'd show a quick, simple rotation of the 3D model. So again, this is happening remotely a thousand miles away. So all you need is uh, a Bluetooth connection to something that has a connection to the internet. <laughs> and the, uh, and the, the sponsor says, correct. <laughs> all right, next item. A large <clears throat> Norwegian contractor asked the technology company Enlink what it could do to reduce the strain of measuring up and drilling holes overhead in concrete ceilings. An awkward, time-consuming time consuming, and potentially hazardous task for construction workers. Two years later, the company produced a drilling robot controlled by an iPad, which was demonstrated at a robotics conference in New York City this spring. The robot has a full range of sensors, allowing it to know its own position, and another set of sensors allows it to power, power drill predefined holes with millimeter precision. Enlink says it is developing the robot's capability to interact with building information models. Uh, another item here spinning forward the drone technology, uh, demonstrating the additive nature of technology dances. The next development combines the idea of drones and robots. J Luke Abafi wrote a June ENR story about Carnegie Mellon University's Robotics Institute, where researchers have developed an unmanned aerial vehicle that can fly itself. I think some members of that team are here, so there's people here who know a lot more about this than me, and you can probably find them and talk to them. Um, the drone takes 3D scans of its surroundings and can process the data fast enough to navigate in real time without hitting objects. The scans are accurate enough to use for other purposes too, such as infrastructure inspection. Called the Aerial Robotic Infrastructure Analyst, ARIA, the device uses laser scanners to collect 40,000 XYZ points per second to build a point cloud of its surroundings. ARIA can put 3D a 3D laser scanner anywhere, reach areas of a structure that are out of GPS range and dangerous for humans, and come back with a complete point cloud without holes and quickly, the researchers say. Megan Morris was on assignment for ENR in Delft, the Netherlands, in June and brought back a story about what a Delft University professor jokingly refers to as limestone pooping bacteria. <laughs> Hank Jonkers has patented a concrete mix that includes bacteria that when exposed to water produces cal calcium carbonate that fills in any micro cracks that might develop. Jonkers believes his self-healing concrete could extend the life of concrete structures by 30%. Demonstration projects include an irrigation canal in the Netherlands, um, an irrigation canal, oh, uh, a, a irrigation canal in Ecuador, and a parking garage in the Netherlands. The additive does increase first cost, however, uh, quite a bit. 
And although multiple lab studies have shown it outperforming control materials, there's no definitive proof that it will stand the test of time. Experts think it could be in more widespread use in as few as five or as many as 20 years. A liquid spray version, however, for mortar repairs and surface touch-ups is expected to be on the market in the US this fall. Small-scale 3D printing was in the now section, but in the relatively near future, we will be printing large-scale structures. A 2,000-square-foot office building is planned for Dubai that will be built layer by layer by a 20-foot-tall 3D printer, says the UAE National Innovation Committee. All interior furniture, detailing, and structural components also will be built using 3D printing technology, combining a mixture of special reinforced concrete, glass fiber reinforced gypsum, and fiber reinforced plastic. The building is the result of a partnership between Dubai and Win Sun Global. Working with global architects and engineers, Gensler, Thornton Tomasetti, and Siska and Hennessy. The project team expects to save time, labor costs, and reduce construction waste. The project is the first major initiative of the Museum of the Future, launched earlier this year by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, the Prime Minister of Dubai. A separate effort is underway to 3D print a full-scale bridge. This is the thing that was mentioned yesterday. An R&D startup called MX3D, supported by Autodesk, ABNB, ABB, and others, plans to build an ornate metal bridge over a canal in Amsterdam using two six-axis industrial robots. Reports about the schedule vary from this year to a couple of years from now. The robots will start on either bank and work their way toward each other, ejecting molten steel to craft intricate beams from multiple angles instead of on a more typical horizontal plane. Design is by Joris Larman, who says the process allows unprecedented freedom of form. The project is a collaboration between MX3D, Autodesk, the contractor Heijmans, and many others. Thanks to MX3D for giving us permission to show its short video. First, they were little worm-like blobs. It was hard to see, but we saw a universe of possibilities. Of course, many things went wrong. A welding machine exploded, nozzles got stuck, and the robot got disoriented. But then, they became long lines, complex curves, and double curved oval tubes. It was like drawing from midair. And after endless testing, we were able to speed up the process and produce this complex sculpture of lines. And now, we are ready for the ultimate poster project, to test all facets of this highly promising printing technology. A large-scale object that is functional and meaningful. We are going to print the steel bridge in Amsterdam. Cool, huh? <laughs> so everyone I talked to had ideas for the future. Ed Gibson told me, research is underway at Rice, Yale, ASU, UT El Paso on compact, on what he calls compact mobile off-grid water, water treatment systems that use nano-engineered catalyst membranes 
and light activated materials to make water treatment much more affordable and portable. Research at Georgia Tech, ASU, UC Davis, and New Mexico State are working on, Ed says, nat nature compatible biogeotechnical approaches to boosting the resiliency of civil infrastructure, looking at biomimicry and bio-inspired solutions to everyday construction problems such as soil stabilization, foundations, and tunneling. Others mentioned driverless cars, will they impact highway design, automated plan checking in city buildings departments, that's well within reach. And just this morning over breakfast, one of the attendees I was talking to said, how about data flowing seamlessly from design through construction and then being used for operations? And will that really become a reality? And then there's the really hard problem, breaking down the political and institutional barriers to the adoption of new technology. I have to credit ENR's Tom Sawyer for pointing out that we should pull away from individual products and systems and consider what this all means, the big picture. Tom was talking to Brad Hardin, the chief technology officer of Black & Veatch, about coming to speak at ENR's Future Tech event in New York City on October 1. Plug, 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 it's a cool event. <laughs> he told me, he told me that Brad used the word theory rather than prediction. Good theories, Tom reasoned, are built upon observations of known facts and patterns that suggest how they might project into the future. We know, for example, that electronic data defining conditions and events in the real world are being collected in quantities that are expanding at an exponential rate. Vast amounts of data are coming from sensors and as an incidental byproduct of our increasingly location and condition aware devices, cars, smartphones, and watches, the data come from around the world over the internet and into an expanding universe of cloud-based analysis software. Big is a mighty small word to be used for the concept of big data. It's more like the data we're creating another dimension that mirrors the ones we know. And just as we have learned how to combine the elements of the more familiar dimensions to create the built world, turning clay into brick and ore into steel, we are learning how to sort the elements of the data dimension to reveal and form knowledge. We now sort data for information, the way a photographer uses a camera to frame a picture so the camera can gather just the right amount of light to arrange millions of pixels into an image. With machine learning and artificial intelligence, our technology may begin to automatically frame the data, focus it into insightful knowledge, and offer it to us unbidden. Instead of forming questions and seeking information, new levels of artificial intelligence will give us answers to important questions before we even know what to ask. Infrastructure could scope, optimize, and schedule its own maintenance and propose RFPs for human authorization. It could suggest its own budget and financing and offer alternatives. When directed to act, it could solicit and analyze bids and monitor and optimize job performance by modulating supply chains using predictive analysis to schedule accurately rain delays weeks in advance. Design alternatives would be offered constantly and incrementally through all stages of, stages of design and materials optimized for initial and life cycle cost performance, delivery, and constructability. Job sites would become safer and more efficient as the data analysis understands the job schedule, the crew load balancing, the physical stages of activities in the dimensions of time and space, and can interpret physical human risk as clashes to be mitigated in advance. And the analysis engine does this not because we've entered reams of data, 
but because it knows things by inferring them from millions of points of data that already exist in the data dimension. Too much like science fiction? That's what our younger selves might have said about today. Once again, thanks to the many sources who helped me with this presentation, and thanks to you for being here to listen. <laughs> So Wayne said that if we had a few minutes, we could take a few questions. What, is, what does Wayne say about the time? Good, t good on time if anybody wants to ask any questions or open anything for discussion. Anybody out there? No? Uh, Ken Dukowski with Burns and Mac. So you alluded to it a little bit, but what do we think about the technology impacting the number of people involved on <laughs> projects and how that will actually hurt people implementing these technologies? Yeah, yeah everyone that I, that's, it has been a common topic. I didn't bring it into the talk, but the re response to this ever automating uh, scenario of the universe is what happens to the people? And everyone's been talking about that. And do I have an answer? Of course not, but I think that um, you will, we will see, you know, we, this is, there's been a, a shift over time. What happened to when we began to have dishwashers and washing machines and we didn't have to do the things that we had, that we were accustomed to having to do, you know, planting the crops and, you know, what happened? You might have said that at, at those points of time in the past and worried about what will people do when they don't have to spend all their time harvesting wheat or washing dishes, or you know, the other labor-saving devices that have come along over the course of long course of time. I think part of the, the issue here that makes everybody very concerned is, that, again, this pace of change. Things are changing so fast. These other changes came along. It seems to us, it seems to me, more gradually, and now it just it seems to be hitting us so fast that it makes us worry. But I, I only can believe that sorted itself out in the past, and that, pe that people are going to find other occupations. If, if work can be automated, we are going to be migrating toward other types of work. Hi, Kristen Parrish from Arizona State. Thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Can you see me? <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry. It's hard. It's hard. Everybody's been <laughs> saying it's so hard. Close. It is hard up here. Um, I was curious about a lot of what you presented was developed by maybe electrical engineers or mm. mechanical engineers. If you could just comment on the need for the construction industry to start interfacing more with uh, trades or engineering disciplines that maybe we haven't historically spent as much time with. You're right. The electrical engineers are, at, you know, are really in the thr throes of it. But I do think that, you know, you heard me ta saying Thornton Tomasetti, ta um, you know, uh, Gensler. I mean, the, I think people, other industry participants, are in there. They're getting in there and, you know, getting their their hands dirty with the new technology or clean it's clean technology. Um, I I I think we're getting involved. There's always a need for more research. This is perennial that we need more research in the construction industry. I mean, we all know how much, what's the percentage of the total, I don't know it, I can't, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's small. It's way too small, and it's smaller than other industries. So there's certainly room for more research, but, uh, but I, I, I don't agree that nobody's in there trying. There are people in there trying. CII, for example. <laughs> Hi, Mike Dubrell from, uh, from Toronto, Canada. Um, some of this stuff is here now. We have a project that's launching in s September to do a large 3D aerial survey of a nuclear power facility that is getting scheduled for uh, shutdown in 10 years. So all the plans, all the work, all the technologies in place and, and ready to go. So similar to that bridge, but in this case, it's a power plant. It's gonna be 3D printed, did you say? It, it, we're gonna sur survey, do a, a, a 3D laser survey of the facility prior to the 
planning requirements to uh, take a long-term look at what it takes to shut down the facility. Right, so, so you're building a model with, with using drones and... and um, Absolutely. So, yeah, cool. So all that technology, the, the smart guys, uh, they put it all together and it's ready to go. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, if, if you can, if, if we could write about that, come and give me your card. <laughs> if they let you write about it, if they let us write about it. Hi, Jan. Couldn't resist but ask a question. So you've been the editor-in-chief of ENR for, for a couple of years. Couple. Uh, a couple. <laughs> and, and so you've seen the technology from way back when through the current time. What's your favorite technology? Oh, my. <laughs> I thought, you, you, I thought you were going toward the pace of change, where I was going to say, you know, I started no, I'm typing. I'm too old on, for the pace I of started change. typing. <laughs> I started at ENR when, when we had typewriters, I have to tell you. Um, but you're saying my favorite technology. Wow. Well, I really do love these drones. I mean, I'm just, I'm just having a great time watching drones, although I, I know there are concerns and cautions, and we have to go slow, and we have to figure out how to. But the things that they can do to put, to put them to work. That is really cool. <laughs> I like drones. I also loved it when we first got into 3D modeling, and that, you know, was very exciting. As one of our one of the uh, session implementation sessions yesterday talked about, you know, just being able to show worker craft workers in 3D instead of the 2D isometric, the the 3D isometric, and what that the whole th 3D world, the whole world of creating. Um, you know, doing it um, virtually before you do it in reality, it makes so much sense. And that's very exciting, too. Anyone else? I think it's good. We're good. Thank you all.